busiest lifestyle that I have been leading for the last you know, 10 years since best job in the world. It's nice now to finally take a foot off and start going, okay, this is now my new best job in the world. Being a dad, <laughs> that, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so something else that I wanted to understand, like you, you talked about how going out there and taking the wilderness expert training and all of that helps to, you know, build a profile. But let's say if someone's coming out of high school and they see your profile and some other profiles and they want to do this, they want to do adventure expeditions as a job. Is there any degree that you'd recommend in, or in general, anything that they could do to sort of have a maybe, you know, ground hold of, so let's say I finished a college degree and then get to doing this? Is there one particular thing? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I have a very good friend of mine who is an extremely successful businessman who owned a very, very big financial firm. He was the founder of that for sort of 20, 10 years and turned it from a, you know, a startup into a, a billion dollar company. And it was only really when he, I overheard him talking to someone um, about a very unexpected sort of degree choice that he recommended for people that I started to realize the value in what I'd done. So he obviously worked in a financial firm and most people, employees that would come to him would be, you know, they'd have a law background or a business background. And he said, look, I'd much rather employ an engineer as their first degree than anybody else because engineering gives you a level grounding of so many different opportunities and perspectives in life you know from learning a different language which might be you know the engineering terminology to maths to physics to to design to art it really gives you a level grounding across so many different fields and it was only then I realized yes I might have studied for an automotive systems engineering degree and I might never have used it but that education for those three years gave me such a good grounding in life and getting a job like the best job in the world when I when I, people ask me you know why did you win the best job in the world I had a high average across many different fields. I didn't excel hugely in any of them. And engineering gives you that grounding so you can be a high average in so many different areas of life. So you can, when you need to, and you need to pull on your design side, you can draw something on the back of an envelope or you can get your maths and remember some of that part. So I think engineering is definitely one of the ones that even though I got it originally, I didn't realize its value until someone else had sort of highlighted it to me. Yeah, I mean, and we, India, I think in India, we have a lot of engineers going on. So Huge hope... number of engineers. Yes, absolutely. In every field. Ho hopefully someone does what you're doing right now it's in, in the Indian subcontinent also. So I, I, we talked a little bit about how the coronavirus has affected you and the tourism and adventure sports industry. You're doing things just in Australia right now. But how do you see things going forward for adventure sports, adventure expeditions, and just you in at a very personal level also, do you see maybe a post a, a year or two when sort of things calm down? Do you see some fear being there in people of doing these things now? Or do you see these things will get back to the same boom as they were? Oh, it's going to take a long time, I think, for people on a general travel level to get confidence to do things overseas. You know, I, I've been, I'm lucky enough to have been fairly, I think a, a life of adventure has prepared me pretty well for this because when you have adventures, you've got to be able to pivot and move and change your outlook very quickly and adapt, adaptable, I think is the word. Um, and being stuck in a situation like we are now where we don't know what the future is, but opportunities and doorways open and close almost immediately in front of you allows you to deal with those situations. Um, for the travel from the from a travel perspective, I think generic travel, package holiday deals, cruises, those things are going to suffer, you know, long a long time into the future. The good thing from an adventure travel company's perspective is we take adventurous people with us. And they don't lose that appetite. They are still, you know, they have a voracious appetite to want to do something and they will work to the boundaries of what they're given. So if we tell them they can go to the Arctic, they'll do the toughest adventure they can in the Arctic, which is right up here. If we tell them we can only go to Australia, they'll do the toughest adventure they can find in Australia. They're always going to push their boundaries. Um, and travel has always, you know, been associated with risk especially when you go to countries where you can't get insurance or you've got to have a yellow fever certificate or the border is is volatile those elements always are there and we deal with them when we travel to them um having a, something like the coronavirus thrown on us now is a bigger one because obviously there is no registered cure or no immunity to it yet as that develops, the world will start to get back to some semblance of normality. Because, you know, we've had to travel through countries where you need a yellow fever vaccination certificate. And it's just par for the course. And you'd always get your hepatitis A and B when you go to this country. You'd always get your typhoid or your diphtheria injections. So you've always had to 
get vaccinations to go overseas to do certain trips anyway. I think this just adds another element of it. The difficult thing for the future from our perspective as a operator who has to look after our clients and for a client for a client who has to take out travel insurance is exactly that how do companies in the future insure themselves for liability and how do individuals insure themselves for health when they're going overseas to more risky countries you know to go to somewhere like nepal to go to somewhere like uganda where the healthcare systems aren't nearly as good as we're lucky enough to you know benefit from here that's then throwing an onus back on the individual to say, well, you're taking the risk to go and do that and we're not going to insure you. So will our adventurous people take that extra level of risk to go and do one of these adventures? I think only time will tell. But I think you made a very interesting point about people just pushing their limits. So do you see a lot of customers now and back coming back to you or do you, uh, or do you see more business and sort of expanding in new customers? Like how, has the expansion been good or the repetitiveness of just the people who started out keep on coming back and that sort of provides your business with a good model? Um, it's, it's a whole new landscape that we're looking at in a way. The one that's, I think people uh, this surprised me a bit. We've always pushed our corporate market. We've always tried to get corporate groups to go and do one or two day adventures here in Australia. And it was a hard market to crack because there was lots of people out there doing it. Now that we're sitting talking on Zoom and virtually every company has been talking on Zoom for the last five or six months, people are in this post Zoom era. They're Zoomed out. So they want to do things in person. And to go and do things in person in an office is still risky. To go and do things in, a, in the great outdoors through a shared adventure activity like kayaking or mountain biking or trekking, it gives people a chance to reconnect to start those relationships again in a different way that Zoom offers. So we've seen our corporate market, certainly inquiries have grown exponentially, and we're starting to roll some of those out in August, September, and October of this year. So that's a good thing. Um, from a travel perspective, an individual's perspective, um, obviously it smashed our, our international opportunities, but it's given us the chance to look closer to home. And only now, you know, I, I feel like I'm going on an adventure when I use my passport. When I leave a country of, of origin and when I go to a new country, that's when my adventure starts. To come to terms in my head with the fact I've, I can go on adventures within Australia, which 95% of the world see as an amazing adventure destination, I've got to start to see comfort in the fact that leaving Australia isn't the adventure, but going out there and finding them for our clients within Australia has got to be the new norm, certainly for the next six to you know, 24 months. Okay, so I, I was reading up about you and I saw that you wrote this amazing book, uh, The Best Job in the World, How to Make a Living of Doing What You Dream. So we are trying to do what you did through that book similarly, trying to tell people that you can do what you love and you can earn money out of it. Can you talk a little bit about like doing what you love and earning through it and what the book was about? Yeah, I mean, so when I first set out on my Africa expedition in, in 2007, I had spent a lot of time sitting in forums on the internet and garnering information, almost too much information. You know, I printed out every map and every border formality and I had so much information in my head. But you can sit at that computer for hours, days, weeks and months and never actually make the step to go and do things. And I'd read so many inspiring travel books that were written by people who are beautifully creative and can almost conjure up an image in your mind through their words. And I knew I wasn't that beautifully creative with my words. So I thought, how do I, how do I build a book that draws on the experiences that I gained from building my own expeditions to give people the tools to go and do it for themselves? So it was almost, I suppose, a crossover between a travel journal, but also um, a business lesson tool that gave people some of the, you know, the, the information they need to go out and go, okay, how do I do this? How do I do that? How do I find sponsorship? How do I work out wh what I want to do? Um, so really the book was, it was a labor of love because I can't sit still for long enough to write a book normally. So for four months, I really had to concentrate, but it was grouping together, you know, a few travel experiences and lessons learned with how I went about starting the first trip. Um, and, and what it led to from there. So yeah, it, it's something that I'm really proud I did. I don't know I'd have the patience to write a second book, but it definitely gives people the idea of, okay, how do I take that first step to going and living the life that I want to lead? Yeah, uh, so I, I want to move on to something a bit personal that I found really motivating. I, I see that you talked a lot about, you know, putting the phone down and looking out there and sort of taking a social media snooze. But on the other hand, I see that you're a digital guru and you do all this marketing through social media. So how, how, do, how do I find, you know, strike the balance between? 
Good question. So, yeah, the best job in the world was all about showcasing the world, uh, showcasing the locations to the world. So it's about using every platform at your disposal. But it was only really after four or five years of doing that that I started to realize I was not using my own eyes. I was using a digital pair of eyes to tell a story. And I was missing out on some of those key moments. So what we do, what the ethos that I've sort of taken forward from that 10 years later with Best Life Adventures is we visit wilderness areas of the world where there generally isn't reception. And that's a bloody marvelous thing because it means that people are disconnecting from having to tell a story in the moment and they're reconnecting with the people that are in the group around them. And it's only through those times and those relationships and those end of day campfire conversations that relationships are really built on a personal level. It's only after about day three of an expedition and people being disconnected from their phones that they start to realize they don't need to be doing this reporting every moment. Or when it's an awkward moment, they're sitting by someone they've never met before, they pick up their phone as the first thing rather than sitting and talking to a new person. And it's after about three or four days that you start to realize, okay, I don't need to have that serious connection to technology. And usually if our trips run for sort of seven to 14 days, within that last 48 hours when people realize that are going back to normality, it's then that they start to get a bit twitchy and usually it's the first person in the group that turns their phone on and the phone goes ping that everybody else in the room goes, Oh my God, I've realized there is this strange thing in my hand again and I'm, I'm coming back to normality. So we don't, I mean, when was the last time that you left your phone for seven days? When can you think back? You know, it's, it's infinite almost. So yeah. it's a refreshing thing to have. But, I but so seeing like the current time and this brings me to my next question, which is like in this time where all of us are sort of locked indoors and we can't really go out there. And you you've been someone who's sort of I think lived in the lap of Mother Nature and you're still doing some stuff out there. But to a lot of us, going out there and enjoying nature has become a little bit difficult. And so a lot of people pick up their phones just to cope up with that. What what role do you think? Like how do we put our phones down and just enjoy nature? in this sort of pandemic type area where we need something to sort of cope with the mental health problems that can come out of this sort of being inside and being in just closed doors. All it, and it's, it, it's massively tough. It's massively tough. And it changes obviously country by country, month by month at the moment. You know, we were in, in almost total freedom here in Australia a, a month ago. And then there's been big outbreaks that have happened down in Victoria and in Melbourne, which has meant that restrictions have been reimposed. My family are in the UK. They've been under fairly tough conditions for most of the summer. Um, and obviously over in India, it's pretty much the same. This is this is new ground. It's very hard to give a, a one thumb, one rule fits all for everybody. But the appreciation um, of nature has always been a big grounding point for me. It's a point where if I can see the start and the end of the day, and if I can witness that sunrise and that sunset, they're those moments of sort of clarity where even if it's from a rooftop across a city, there's something special about watching sunrise, you know, being out there and using every moment of the day, breathing in however fresh your air is, whether it is in the middle of a city or whether it's on the top of a mountain, breathing in that fresh air, getting that touch point to nature, whether it's in a park in a city or whether it is, you know, the north of the Himalayas, wherever your nature is, wherever your happy place is, being able to get to that as much as possible to physically reset and mentally reset every day is something that I'm finding great value in now. I've now, you know, in the last three or four weeks i've tried to work out how i can make the most more of my day in the situation we're in and i'm now doing this thing i call we call pre-dawn which is getting up before that sunrise for having a 30 to 40 minute yoga session twice or three times a week to really focus my mind on what the day ahead lies it's my time it's not my son's time it's not my wife's time it's not my business's time it's ben time so getting that before even the sun comes up has become really valuable to me. And then being there for, for that sunrise, you know, whatever time of the day that's happening, to get out at some point in nature and probably after this interview, I'll go out for a, a run for my one hour without my boy here. And then by the end of the day, sitting down with my little man and watching sunrise with sunset with him, whether it's sitting on the beach or whether it's sitting on the balcony is an, again, another touch point with nature. And if you're lucky enough to have your weekends and get out into nature to go and, you know, walk along a river, to go and swim in an ocean, to go and do something which just gives you that connection back to you know one of these great strengths of the planet you know the elements um you know fire earth wind and water if you can touch point with those at least once or twice a week that connection back to the planet really resets you as a human yeah i mean that's beautiful i i watch a sunrise out of my window every day but that that just makes my day that 
I hope everyone who's watching this can do that also. So I think something that's a bit more serious that I have to ask is a lot of people when they consider professions like yours or some alternate professions, what they're worried about is finances and money and how how they're going to sustain themselves. So what sort of outlook did you have going out there? Because it, it, it wasn't all rosy from day one, like you said. Nah. So how, how, how do you think you take that sort of leap of faith, keeping in mind that you need to have this corpus of money also, and you need to earn a living and live your life that way also? Um, I think one of the things, and it, my, my parents have always been very supportive and supportive in, in the let's let him go and do what he wants to do rather than financially. I've always had to fund my own adventures, but mum and dad saying, you know, you've done your study, you've proved yourself at degree level now, you don't need to go and find a job immediately, just take a breather and enjoy life. That was the catalyst that gave me the springboard to go and then say, okay, well, I'm going to go and work in Africa. And then to realize that my first project wasn't going to happen next week or next month or next year. It was going to happen three years down the line. It's a long time for people to focus on. And to be able to work hard to build up a cash pool to make these things happen is a very hard pill to swallow sometimes, you know, to, to have that sort of time scale. I, I did it in a fairly safe way, I suppose. I did it with a Land Rover, which was my house and my office and my bedroom and my kitchen. Everything was self-contained. I could lock it up. I could leave it. I could be you know, fairly confident it was secure. I met other people on that journey who were doing it on you know, bicycles. And they'd got their life wrapped up in two panniers on the back of their bike and a backpack. So to be able to go and do something doesn't need to be a high cost. It doesn't need to really go out and you know, spend a year doing that journey. Just to be able to go, okay, I'm not going to take a year of my life out to do this. I'm going to take three weeks out. And it might be that I ride to my job interview in Delhi in six weeks time and I get on a bike and that's my journey or it might be that I say okay I'm gonna I'm gonna witness you know sunrise on the southern tip of India but I'm gonna go and do that as my own journey it might be a six month cycle that you go and do or a bike ride or to say that I'm gonna catch public transport to go and do the whole thing you know there are very every everyone spells adventure in a different way and as long as you push yourself past the boundary of where you feel comfortable into that slight niche of uncomfortable that's where you start to grow as a human being so whatever that journey looks like, the funding of it doesn't have to be three years worth of planning. It could be, I'm going to try and do that journey based on, you know, 5,000 rupees. That's my budget. And I'm going to have conversations with people along the way that will assist me to get me there. And that might be the plan or the project. So they don't have to be you know, time consuming or financially consuming. It just has to be something where you feel like, okay, I'm going to push myself a little bit further to find out what I'm all about as a human. But uh, I mean, I mean that's great. It's it's all it's always about you know take. I I agree. It's about sort of taking that first leap. But once someone takes that first leap, do you think in your industry of of tourism or even adventure sports, there's enough opportunities for someone to earn money and like do do good for themselves once they've taken that first leap and gone the long distance? Yeah, I think the good thing as well with um certainly that the the situation prior to this year was that adventure travel is very seasonal. And it allow people to sort of migrate and become slightly nomadic in a way. And if you're happy and you're content with not having a home base that you have to pay a rent on or mortgage on, and you're able to pack your things, you know, your life up into a backpack and find yourself comfort in working seasonally. So to go and do maybe a ski season in Canada, to come back and do a, a summer season in Australia or to do a rafting season in Norway and then come back and do it in Tasmania you can migrate and you can move around the planet. This is obviously going to change considerably with the way that the world is now, but still to work as an adventure guide, to work as somebody who chases the sun quite often um, and follows summertime. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful way to live. Vitamin D that the sun gives us is an extremely good motivator and good inspirer anyway. And I was lucky enough to chase summers in Northern and Southern hemispheres for six years and not do a winter. So if you're out there and you're motivated and you're, and you're game enough, following that sort of lifestyle, following that, that, that line of work in the adventure space. It is, and you're never going to make a fortune doing it. Someone said you can't make a career out of adventure. You can make a career out of it. You just can't make a fortune from it. Yeah, but that's a good way to put it because you, you're making a fortune of experiences at the end of the day. And that, exactly. that, yeah, I think that's the better thing. So, I mean, it's, it's been what 10 years of living the best life in the world. How, how, what sort of definition have you got of that? Now, what is, the best life in the world, according to you, that humans should lead or something like that. I mean, it's subjective, 
Well, what's your definition? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and believe me, there's, there's still down days in the best life of the world. There's days where you think, you know, is it, is it all worthwhile? What am I doing? Should I be doing something different? Um, the fulfillment and enjoyment that the last 10 years has given has based, been based around interactions with new people, mainly. I mean, that's what gives me my, my happy times more than anything, building up communities around the world that I can, you know, connect with now so easily over social media. You know, I speak to someone that I met in South Africa in 97 who now lives in Canada via video call, you know, a couple of times a month. And having those connections and having those people gives me that satisfaction. It also gives me, and it opens doorways of opportunity because I now know that that person over there is more than likely going to become a client of one of our trips or one of our business, you know, for our business. So it's nice to have those connections from a personal level, um, to have had and still continue to have experiences around the world in new landscapes and new countries. Um, they're the things that give me the inspiration and feel like I've still got the best life. And think, I think always that travel provides me and a million other people with the best classroom in the world it's the best place to study it's the best place to do your lessons to go and build yourself as an individual there's no curriculum there's just go out there try it experience it and see see if you don't come back a better person i challenge you on that one because you'll be more worldly you'll have more experience you'll be more accepting of cultures of religions of foods of skin colors and you'll come back a better more understanding human being so using your passport more than anything is probably the best currency you can have yeah. Um, so when we talked, we, we were talking about you just finished your gardening and you had come in. I've tried a bit of gardening myself, this quarantine. And so I, I just wanted to know, what, what, is there any sort of advice uh, nature uh, around nature that you have for people that they can explore into? Obviously, everyone has their own constraints, but if they could do something, what would you recommend that they do that brings them closer to nature You know, d- during this time? Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a phrase that's ban- been banded around for about the last 10 years, um, originated with a guy called Alistair Humphreys, who's a UK explorer, and his, his terminology was micro-adventures. Um, and everybody looks at, you know, adventure could be climbing Everest or crossing the Arctic, and these are huge undertakings financially, physically, you know, in time. But to be able to go and do something that is um, close to home, that might just be on a Wednesday after work, it might be taking a tent and camping, somewhere where you've always driven past and you thought, oh my God, that'd be interesting doing that. Or saying, rather than driving to so-and-so's house, I'm going to cycle there next time. Being able to build up and introduce adventure into the most um, unexpected areas of your life gives you a more adventurous approach to life. So my little two-year-old, who's now going to be three in two weeks' time, he's always been in my backpack on my carrier. I always carry him around and we go off and we walk the dog virtually every day. We've got a garden and a nice, lucky-sized garden in Australia. Um, rather than sleeping in his, in his bed you know, about three weeks ago, we put the tent up at the bottom of the garden. Then we just did that because it was cool. Ooh, so to see the woman boring and numb to us, to see like that really gave me a, has given me a different vision on the world again. So just to walk up, to put a, a tent up in about three weeks' time, now he's confident staying in ones it's just another the way to sort of feed and twitch the adventure muscle that sits within all of us yeah uh, so uh, um, i mean so, can, can you hear me i'm sorry uh, yeah yeah uh, no, oh. I'm clear. wait let, let me just give me one minute i'll sort of check up on my internet it's going a bit weird I'm still there just went slightly there we go back yeah 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 so, no, I mean, you want to take a break, drink water, you can do all of it. We can just cut it out. That, that's absolutely no worries. So, uh, uh, just, uh, I think that, that, that was an, uh, that was an, an micro adventures is something that's interesting. That's something I never have personally explored. But, I mean, if, if there was one adventure that you personally think everyone should sort of do, like one big adventure that you could take them to, if someone just came up to you and told Ben, hey, I want to do one adventure in my lifetime, which one would it? Um, I love self-powered adventures more than anything because, you know, driving a Land Rover is you know, a particularly easy way to get around the world. I've done trips on, uh, on bicycles and being, uh, having your life condensed in that sense to having small numbers of items that have usually got double purposes. You don't want to take something with you that just has a single purpose. Being able to pack that sort of like your life into the panniers on a bike or a backpack and to go and do a journey just for the sake of doing the journey 
um, and not really having too much of an itinerary, just allowing things to happen. I think they're easy, low cost, entry level, um, life experiencing and um, energy giving journeys. Those sorts of ones where you're, so, you know, you're powering yourself and you don't, you don't need to be a good cyclist. You don't need to be someone who's ever got on a bike before. Just go and give it a go. My, my, my dear wife, um, Sophie, decided when she was three months pregnant that she needed to go and do a crazy adventure before we had our son. So she decided, I've never skateboarded before. I'm going to go and skateboard around Tasmania. So she took with her a skateboard that had another skateboard attached to the back of it. On the back skateboard, there was a plastic crate that had a tent in, some food, changes of clothes, notepad. And she decided she'd fly into Hobart, the capital of Tasmania. She would literally learn to skateboard when she arrived. And then she spent the next five weeks skateboarding 1,200 kilometers all around Tasmania. No experience, no plan, just this is what I really would love to go and give a go to. So being able to say, okay, now's my time. She got up there, she got on the plane, and she flew away and did it. And it was still, she still says today, it was one of the most um, awe-inspiring, life-opening adventures that she's ever had. Right. And also, I, I saw your life, and you've basically lived in nature. When, when did that sort of happen, that you knew that nature and like the earth and the elements is something that you want to be surrounded by, and you just love doing and being around? Oh, goodness. Um, you've got to rewind probably to uh, when I was seven or eight years old when mum and dad used to take us on family holidays up to the north of Scotland. So we used to live in the south of England and it was probably an eight to 12 hour drive to get to the north of Scotland. But all of our adventures and our holidays used to be we'd just rent a cottage in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by maybe a big lake or a lock on the edge of the coast, you know, open to the elements, going out and doing things. And it's not great the weather in Scotland. So quite often it'll be a wet, miserable, cold day. Often enough, we'd get beautiful days. But being able to have that touch point early on in life with nature, realizing that you can do things outdoors, whatever the elements are throwing at you, that I suppose was the grounding that I needed to realize. Opportunity is out there in the great outdoors, wherever you look. To go there and embrace it and to, to enjoy it and to make it common with your daily day day-to-day -day thoughts is a really important part of it and it's that that's grown and built and it's that mentality that i'm trying to impart into our little boy who's called atlas uh, and now so that he gets that same feeling and understanding from very very early on that's a beautiful name by the way it really goes like atlas just <laughs> roaming around the world i'm sure he's gonna do that uh, do what his name suggests so I think the last question that I have is going to help a lot of people, which is if you if you could give so tell one thing to young Ben who's just starting out, just out of degree college, what would that one piece of advice be that you could give to yourself just, you know, when you're just starting out and maybe there's something you want to do differently or something? Um, there's, there's so many million, a million cliches you could throw in here. Um, I think having a, an experience of many, many different things and just giving some of them a go for the sake of it and not seeing victory or success as being the guarantee is a thing that really you know is valuable today so being able to go and say well maybe i won't succeed in that but i'm going to give it a go maybe you know i'm not very good at surfing but i've tried it and i've fallen off a lot enough times i'm not really good at the maths thing but when i need it I'm, it's there so giving everything a go just for the sake of it and not worrying about success or failure is a really, really important part. And certainly with Atlas at the moment, he's learning to ride. He's just got his first bike, you know, having two weeks for his birthday. And I'm getting him going on a scooter at the moment. And every time he falls off it, he's like, daddy, I don't like it. I'm no good. It's like, well, yes, but it's better to give it, better to try it and fail than never try it at all. And it's a real cliche, but it's a really important one. That, but that's, that's a beautiful line. I think cliches are cliches because they're good advices. So a lot of people repeat them. But, Absolutely. So I, yeah, I think I, I think it, I'd like to thank you a lot for doing this for us, and like this this means a lot to us that you came on board and did this interview. It's amazing, and you, I think everything that you've shared so far. I hope that it helps at least a few people to get out of India and sort of explore the beautiful uh, landscape here it is, and do something that you're doing. So I, I this absolutely, is like, and and you're lucky. You're you're very lucky because obviously India is such a a, a, a smorgasbord of different landscapes and ecosystems and it is an, an epic country if i had you know if i had to go and spend another six months somewhere it would be india because of the diversity it's got so at some point when we get back there maybe we'll do it face to face but yeah if you if when you get this up on online if you wanted to share it with us more than happy to start distributing it out through some of our channels as well we'd love to share it on our facebook page and things
thank you so much and next time you come to india i'll i'll try to show you around certain spots that only locals Love know it. so that you can get a better idea of the place I, I i something that this is apart from the interview i want to ask you that this is something that we're starting out so i think you you've done this to, to an extent and advocated about how do you know make a career out of things doing things that you love and this is what we want to advocate and spread a message of is is there is there anything that you learned so far that you know that could be helpful to us while you know distributing these things or doing something of the sort about what sort of things people should know when they're uh, exploring alternate careers um god that's a it's an open ended one almost isn't it um so you your platform is about just just give me a one line a sentence about what your platform does what you're there for so we we essentially create a virtual museum of stories of these people who have create who have done something that is out of the way not just your 9 to 5 standard job who've done something which they love doing and made a career out of it and we want to tell people hey look you can also do this if you love something why not explore it why not try to do it this other person did it and it worked out great for him so there's a shot that you could take here it's a shot in the dark but there's some hope yeah and and i mean that's that's been it it's sort of frowned upon sometimes by very traditional and standard parents because they see the route and it's an old fashioned route that only now in the sort of last 15 years we've seen as there is a different career path that gets people to an end goal of happiness ultimately i mean what again best life in the world was all about what is the single common thread around the world that makes people happy and have a smile on their face and one of them is family one of them is um a roof over their head and one of them is good times so if you can get all three of those you're pretty confident you're going to get a decent lifestyle family has always been or traditional families have always been about you know school college university job for 40 years retire a bit of retirement and pass away it's not really that challenging as a lifestyle these days and we are very nomadic and able to adapt and shift and change our careers multiple times over our lifetime um and i i certainly have never been one that has thought that okay i'm going to be doing this for the next 2 years 3 years 5 years um even now with a job i've got i know i'm running an adventure travel company but i don't want to be doing this in 2 years time i want to be managing the company and doing something new so i i'm an advocate for definitely thinking that careers are not one all do all and end all they are a stepping stone to get you to the next opportunity um so yeah whether that helps you in any way i don't i don't know <laughs> No no I I get an idea of what you're saying it it's about the idea is to just put out there that you know this these choices are may, might be unique but they're not unprecedented like you've done it this mm. we we've got a guy who's a whiskey taster we actually have a guy who's a chocolate taster like you said so these yeah. things are <laughs> these things are actually out there and people are doing it so if you want to do it just go for it like our idea is to push that leap of faith jump in people and sort of get them yeah. to do that yeah yeah and often and often it's not about saying specifically i'm going to be this job or that job it's about putting yourself out there in enough spaces that when you the harder you work the luckier you get the doorway will open and when it does it's a sliding door moment it's that time when you were there at the right time at the right place i'd been back from africa for a week when the best job in the world came online if i'd been 2 months earlier or 2 months later i probably wouldn't have got it it was just opportunity knocked And how was that like though like winning out of 35000 people just being out there and i i saw in one of your articles you said that there was a party winning party but you couldn't go to the party because you had to exactly. do the other set yeah. of interviews <laughs> <laughs> it was um it, yeah it was i mean i i went there um when i put in the application i i never ever even thought that i was going to get anywhere close and and, and i think the people that were in the final a lot of them are banked their entire lives on winning this and they didn't have an out they didn't have an alternative if they failed at the job they were going to go back to normality and they'd be very depressed about it i was already thinking when i got to the final where can i go next in the land rover what's my next journey what do i go home and save for because i'm not going to get this job so what am i going to do when i get home so i'd already got my ulterior plan ready to roll out if something had hadn't happened um the people in the final were very much more skilled than me i mean there was a presenter for cnn there was someone who had a 200,000 people following on youtube i just had no you know inkling that i was going to get anywhere close so for me the win the getting to australia for the final was the win i just got a free trip for 2 weeks to australia thanks very much i'll go home now <laughs> so to then get this job and then spend 6 months which has become you know 11 years out here was just one of those really 
really moments anyway yeah seems a long time ago now <laughs> but uh, it's just beautiful like, i still saw that clip last night I'm, i actually did follow this best because this best job in the world thing just blew up it got a lot of followers but i saw that clip again last night and you know that uh, that whole the the, the aerial yes, shot the moment yeah, <laughs> the moment that is just too beautiful to be in and i was like maybe i'm thinking of doing all the wrong things in the world maybe yeah. i need to do this and enjoy this but see the weird thing is i you, you You'd say, I, I say, I contradiction almost. I say you focus on something and you make it your goal and your destination. But with the best job, I never made it my goal and my destination. It was just it, sort of the, the wave. I rode the wave as far as it would go towards the beach. And it happened to be that I landed on the beach on both feet. So, <laughs> Man, that, that is just amazing. Uh, all right. I think we've taken too much of your time. Uh, th- thank, thank you, you thank, for the time. Thank I you send so us much. some links when you've got them through. I really appreciate it. And good luck with it as an idea and a concept. Thank you so much. We'll do that. We'll we'll be sure. I'll be sure to sort of send you the link, send you this interview and everything. Thank you so much for doing this, Ben. Like it's enjoy your day. Great. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you.